Welcome to episode 82 of Film Courage. My name is Karen Warden. It's kind of cool that we have Ty West here in studio for episode 82, as his last film, The House of the Devil, takes place in the early 80s. So it's a perfect uh, harmony happening here. My name is David Brandon. You can say that today's episode is a prelude to Halloween. You know, I don't think we could have planned it any better. No, no. Um, in addition to Ty West being here in studio, we also have filmmaker Tony Elwood as a special surprise guest here in studio. Tony's in town from, he, um, from North Carolina. Um, he made He's made his share of horror films, including Cold Storage, which we're going to be screening tomorrow night. Yeah, and we also have producer Paul Barrett, who's here with Tony, and he's Tony's producing partner. He's in town from North Carolina as well, and unfortunately we couldn't fit him in studio, but he is hanging out outside with our guy, Ronan Rosner. Yes. So let's yes. wave to, yeah, hello there, Paul. to producer Paul. Uh, our guest today is filmmaker Ty West. Ty is a writer, director, and producer of horror thriller genre films such as The Wicked, The Roost, Trigger Man, IFC's Dead and Lonely, The House of the Devil, Cabin Fever 2, and his latest project, The Innkeeper, starring Sarah Paxton, Pat Healy, Kelly McGillis, and George Riddle. Please welcome to the Film Courage studio, Mr. Ty West. Hello, Ty. Hello, thanks for having me. Hello, thanks Absolutely. for being here. Yeah, welcome, right, Ty. Welcome, welcome Tony. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You this, well. is, this is um, a, a creepy Halloween show yes, already. I love it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, again, gentlemen, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Well, let's get right into where you grew up, Ty, and what would you change about your childhood if you could, if there's anything? Um, <coughs> well, I grew up, you know, in a filmmaking hub that is Wilmington, Delaware, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I think changing part of my childhood... I don't know what I would do different necessarily. Um, I'm an only child, um, which I think by default makes me a little bit of a weirdo. Um, <laughs> and I think I just spend so much time just by myself, kind mm -hmm. of, I don't know, figure things out by myself and watching movies and watching TV. And I was obsessed with, I guess, stuff I could do by myself because I had no other choice. So um, if anything kind of informed me of having my own opinions or having my own sort of creative endeavors, it would be that, you know, it's not having anyone else to do it with me. So... Um, you know, as far as what to change, there isn't really anything I can think of. Like, maybe it'd be cool to be, like, you know, a billionaire's kid. Like, that would be <laughs> kind of fun. Yeah, that would but, be like, cool. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any, like, I don't have any real regrets over my childhood or anything like that. So, okay. um, you know, it's worked out okay so far. Okay, very cool. Let's jump ahead a little bit. Now, I understand you were featured in Teen People magazine. What's the story there? Uh, well, when I was in college, I went to the school. I went, when I was 18, I moved to New York. Uh, I went to the School of Visual Arts. And, um, my friend there, Sean Reed, who ended up being in all my short films and has been in The Wicked, or in, well, he's in The Wicked, but he's been in The Roost and Trigger Man, and more or less in some capacity in every movie I've done. We were standing outside school, and he was probably smoking a cigarette or something, but um, this girl came up to us and asked us if we would be in this magazine. Um, and it had something to do with, it seemed like it had something to do with like fashion or like kids in New York, but then they put all different clothes on us, so it doesn't make any sense. But, um, yeah, it was this weird afternoon that we have where they, they took us down and like to this weird stylish place and uh, put us in goofy clothes and made us kind of in extensions in our hair and made us kind of like, I guess, sort of model or whatever. But it was just a random thing that sort of happened. But oh. it was fun. My, my mom has the picture saved. Oh, very, very cool. cool. Oh, very so it wasn't a when a date with Ty? <laughs> it wasn't. No, uh, sadly it wasn't. <laughs> it's too bad. Oh, so you were once a fashionista. Okay. That's right. One, one and done. <laughs> You know, we understand that you have a photographic memory. Um, you know, what is this? You know, what is this, and, and how does it play out in your life? And, and how has having a photographic memory how has that impacted your filmmaking? Well, I mean, I would say I have a photographic memory. I don't know if that's really real. I bet someone who has a real photographic memory is probably like would you know spit on me for me saying that. But for me, like, I, I like I can't remember names to save my life, but I can remember everyone's face. And as far as like movies and things like that, like I remember them very well. And I. I remember things that I see and read, and that's how, like, because people used to say with House of the Devil, like, oh, how'd you get the 80s so accurate? And I have, it, it, it didn't seem like it was that accurate to me when I was making it. It just seemed like the best we could do. And then everyone came out saying, oh, it's, it's dead on and it's so specific. Um, but it really was just the way I remembered things. And I just tried to recreate it to where I went, this looks like I remember it. Um, and I think that's kind of how I make everything. It's just like I kind of have an idea in my head of, what things look like and I just try to recreate that and if I recreate it and there's something in there that looks weird I just take it out um, so I don't know that's mm -hmm. I, I think it's generous to say photographic memory I think it's because I never pe remember people's names so I just say that <laughs> here go my keys um, 
But uh, yeah, oh, that's okay. the way my brain okay. works. I'd like to say hello to Gregory Bain, who um, writes in, finally sitting in the right place at the right time for film Courage. Um, hello, Nelly Vale 75. That's hello. Antonella Ali Stacy. I hope I'm saying that right. Oh. Um, LL Carrington. That's Lynette Carrington. Um, and I guess coming back to Nelly Vale um, 75. Antonella, it was great to have you join us for the live chat. Yeah. Um, the other night, and it's great to have you here on Film Courage today. She's listening in Germany, uh, Mojave 44, also checking us out. Uh, hello, hey, Michelle. Michelle. Um, you know, when you type in Ty West on Google, uh, pages upon pages, images upon images come up. Um, of the we, rapper? <laughs> <laughs> that, that comes up, too, of, of T.I., but, but there, there's a lot of, of, of Ty of you. West. Um, you know, we're really grateful to have you, you here today. You. How, how often do you do interviews, and, and how important do you believe it is for a filmmaker um, to have relationships with the media? Um, I, I generally do them when people ask, so uh, I've been fortunate that it's relatively often. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like doing interviews, I suppose. I mean, I, I like, um, like for instance, when I screen a movie, I hate doing an intro, but I like doing a Q&A. Um, because I, I, I sort of like having an opinion, so um, that that part of it is sort of enjoyable to me. Um, as far as the relationship with the media, I don't know. I mean, I think there's like the there's an egotistical side of it that's kind of like, uh, since making a film is so traumatic, it's kind of nice to feel cool about yourself for a minute and have people want to interview. Um, and I think that's valuable. And I think it's also valuable for other people out there, specifically filmmakers, to to hear from the people who are doing it. Um, you know, I know for me that like when I first started listening to directors' commentaries on like Laserdiscs and DVDs, like that was interesting because it's the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that. And um, you know, it was interesting to hear right from the horse's mouth like what it was like making this movie. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone is always thinking about it that way so not everyone is really trying to educate as much as they're just going with the egotistical part of it um, and it's a fine line because I, again I think making a film is so traumatic that anytime you get any attention it's just like oh thank you please love me you know it's like <laughs> it's been so hard um, but uh, yeah I mean I think there are some people that do it where I mean like Quentin Tarantino does it very well obviously he has like the gift of gab but he's also he has a lot of good anecdotes and a lot of good stories and a lot of good sort of I guess helpful advice mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the it's, it's, I think it's cool. And and I, I guess, as you know, in addition to that, you know, as I look through a lot of the press you've received, a lot of it, you know, does come, obviously, from the horror genre. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, I was telling Karen last night, there's just so many press outlets that are horror-related. Yep. Do, do you feel like that's a, sort of an advantage you have, that, that, you know, that you can gain interviews and press from all those multiple outlets that maybe the, the drama indie filmmaker doesn't have the same opportunity? Um, it is and it isn't. Um, it is certainly better because you, more press is better than no press. Um, I think that horror press is generally the same people reading it all the time, though. So you're not really gaining much more of a new audience as much as like the people. So it's very it was very beneficial in my first film, The Roost, because mm -hmm. when you're a super low budget movie and you have n no one should care about you, when you can have these outlets say like kind of vouch for you, um, no matter what the outlet is, it gives you some credibility and that because we have no money to either make the movie or promote the movie that's very helpful so in the beginning it's it's uh kind of priceless mm -hmm. um now like i said i feel to a certain degree that i'm just talking to the same people over and over again which is fine i like those people um but uh i, I don't know if it's as valuable from a filmmaker's like you know broad and range as much mm -hmm. as it is in the very beginning but in the very beginning i owe all those sites a, a lot of credit because they they really saw some pictures and read some stuff about the roost and really got behind it. And because of that, it made it seem like a, a real movie. Um, and that was invaluable. So now you've released four films, I believe, that fall into the horror thriller genre. And you're currently working on your fifth? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Is there anything that you hate about the horror thriller genre? We, people always ask what you like. But on Film Courage, we like to take a spin on things. So what, do you, <laughs> what irritates you? Uh, a lot, genre? actually. I mean, I think it's it's... It's sort of my favorite genre, but it's become, like, outrageously lowest common denominator. And mostly because I think in the mid-2000s, right around the time that I was making The Rooster, a year or two before, uh, horror became very popular again. And when it became very popular, it became very successful. And when it became very successful, everyone started doing it. And as soon as one thing became successful, it was like, just do that again, because that works. And so everything became just aimed at like, well, you know, this particular technique works very well, so let's just run that into the ground until it doesn't and then try something else. Because, you know, it's a business and that's the way people look at it and you can't really fault them for doing that, but you can fault the audiences for being so stupid as to just keep going to see them, you know? So um, that's the downside, I think, to the heart, especially right now, is that, you know, if there's 30 horror movies a year, 28 of them are terrible. Um, and 
The problem is that 28 of them still make decent money, so there's going to be 28 more next year that are just as bad, if not worse, um, because you sent the message that, you know, even though they're bad, we'll go see it anyway. Um, and that's really a shame. And then when there's those two really great ones, they don't always do as well. And that's kind of heartbreaking is when you when you actually see a really great movie and it doesn't succeed, um, it's very frustrating because if that movie succeeded, then you'd see other great movies. But when the crappy movies succeed, you just get more crappy movies. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like horror, uh, for, uh, more than any genre, um, really has just become the same movie over and over again. So a lot of copycats and no originality in yeah. some sense? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, every movie looks exactly the same. So You know, I'm just curious, Tony, do you have anything you want to add to what's no, I, I agree. Here? I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. You know, I mean, we had the hardest time getting uh, distribution for cold storage because when we made cold storage, it took me 20 years to get the film made. And by the time we got it made, everyone was looking for, you know, torture porn films. And so... You know, we sat on it for two years until that 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 phase kind of went away, and then people started paying attention to it again. So, you know, when Hollywood or distributors, whatever's hot, whatever's got heat on it, that's what they want. They want that, and they want ten of them. Mm -hmm. And you know, because they they just don't want to take the risk on something original. They they just do not. So mm -hmm. it's it's really tough. Yeah. So, what are some of the best independent films you've seen this year, Ty? Uh, this year. Um uh, probably maybe my favorite movie this year was the Joan Rivers documentary um, okay. because I'm a fan of hers so mm -hmm. it was really satisfying I think it's a great movie um, I thought Winter's Bone was very good um, I think End of the Void is pretty amazing um, I really like Scott Pilgrim which is speaking of a movie that nobody saw yeah. it's not an independent film but that's a movie that nobody really saw and it, it didn't do very well and it's really kind of fantastic mm -hmm. um, I thought Social Network was very good okay. um, what else came out i don't know i mean there, and there's no <laughs> that's, that's that a good list, list. no that's a yeah. good list yeah. Yeah. this is film courage we have filmmaker tony elwood sitting in studio with us and our guest today is sitting right next to him and that's filmmaker ty west writer seth godin talks about busy work that a lot of people use to keep themselves appearing as if they're working on something but really accomplishing nothing and seth says that the real work is what someone puts off um, it's the work that scares you, which you find kind of a million excuses not to do. Tell us how you deal with this. If you fall prey to procrastination, maybe you don't. How do you deal with, you know, putting off certain things? How have you combated this in your career, avoiding certain things that you know you're supposed to get to, but you kind of don't because they're uncomfortable to do? I think we all fall victim to this. I know I do. Um, I, I don't so much struggle from an uncomfortable standpoint. Procrastination, certainly. Uh, you know, I'm my own worst... I mean, I think everybody, or any sort of like artistic person in a way, is their own worst enemy. Um, and, and I can be very self-hating. So I think the self-hatred is what motivates me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's also a really fantastic book that Stephen King wrote called On Writing mm -hmm. um, that I would recommend anyone that writes because it's... A lot of that book is just... It's about sort of his life and how things worked out and how they didn't work out. But a lot of it's also about just like... You know, most people sit around waiting for the muse to come, and I think he has this kind of great quote of saying, to some degree, like he says, like, yeah, but you have to let it know where you're going to be. And so he has a very strict routine of, like, going every, every day, writing for a certain amount of time, no matter how good or how bad it is, doing that, going for a walk, writing some more, and then that's it. And that's like, it's, it's like a day job for him. Mm -hmm. And because he gives himself that routine and because he treats it that way, he has no choice but to kind of be creative. Um, and there's a lot of validity to that because, you know, I, I used to tell people, like, it's not that hard to like write a movie, but it's so easy not to. Um, and I think that's like I write my movies in three to five days at the most because if I don't, I will either lose interest or I will start thinking it stinks and I have a better idea. And that's what everyone always is like. Oh, you know, I wrote like thirty or forty pages, and then I kind of came up with something better. That's what everybody does, but like yeah. you just have to fight your way through it. Um, and it's terrible. It's not enjoyable. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't find filmmaking to be like a pleasant emotional experience it's very traumatic um, and the writing is just the same like it's you gotta really force yourself to get through the draft of it and then once you get there and you realize like oh like that wasn't that bad to do mm -hmm. um, but in the moment it's very terrible and I think it's just a matter of not kind of giving up um, and not like disguising giving up as oh I have a better idea because that's really all that is like you might have a better idea but you can still finish this one so, so does that mean you have this idea sort of simmering, it's bubbling for a long time, and then in three to five days you just sort of you yeah, know, I mean, vomit it out, so to say? I mean, because that, that's a very short period of time. Yeah. Are, are you writing an entire first draft in three, three to five days? Uh, yeah, if not 
a you know a first, second, third, and fourth. I mean, th- the way I do it is not to say that that's a good way to do it, but I, I do think the the idea of like just doing it is is sort of very valuable. But what I do is I have an idea, and then I write kind of a very rough like outline of just mm-hmm. like kind of like or like a beat sheet as they call it in LA, um, and like <laughs> I just kind of like figure it all out to where I'm like, all right, I kind of know what happens in the movie. I don't know specifics of the scene. I don't know dialogue, but I know the gist of everything. Mm-hmm. And then I just lock myself in, and I just have a very miserable weekend or a very miserable week of just not getting up from the computer, and it's horrible. Mm-hmm. But like, it'll get done. It usually takes me three days to write about a sixty to seventy page first draft. Wow. That's really rough, and then I print it out and I go through it like like a teacher with a red pen, mm-hmm. and like then it's really easy because it's tangible. It exists. So even though you feel really crappy about it and it's kind of an overwhelming, once you're holding like sixty five pages, even though the final draft's going to be ninety pages. 65 pages is heavy and you go wow I just did this in three days and so you get this kind of like extra boost of morale and then you go through it and it's very easy to take work that pre-exists and make it better what's very hard is when you're the cursor is blinking on page 30 and there's nothing after it that's really hard to find the motivation once the script actually exists then you just read it and go well this isn't very good and you just fix it um, and I usually do about three rounds of that so like my first draft is usually about 60 to 70 pages and then my second draft is about 75 to 85 pages and then so forth until I get to the point where I can read it and not feel like I have to change things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll usually let a p- couple people read it, and then like a couple weeks later I'll go back and fix a few things that I kind of let myself slide on. But that's, so far, that's been my process on all the six or seven scripts that I've written, or mm-hmm. eight or nine, maybe it is. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about um, being critical of yourself, which I think any, you know, you talked about creative people, we're very hard on ourselves. How do you combat that? Let those voices, maybe people from the past or whatever it is, telling you, oh, you're no good, this, you know, this sucks, whatever. How do you combat that? I guess you just do it. You just ignore it. I mean, no, no, I don't, I think like, if that's a situation that, if you, certainly if you're struggling from something in the past or this feeling that you can't do it, Mm -hmm. well then the only way to do it would be to do it. Prove you know, or like you <laughs> just accept that you're not going to be able to do it, and you are, you know, a failure if that's what. That's the way. Like I look at myself. Like if I can't write a script in a week, then I'm a big loser. And I go, well, that's not true. And I fight through that. Now that's not healthy, but that's just how I do it. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, that's the only way I know how. Okay. Now, do you still have a day job? No, you don't. Okay. I did for my first two and a half films. I don't anymore. Okay. All right. So when you came to that point where you crossed over from making your own films to have s- having someone pay you. What was that like? I mean, was it scary? Did you feel a huge sense of responsibility on your shoulders? Were you excited? Um, it wasn't. Sc- no, it was great. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not cut out for a day job. Uh, I'm not better than it. I'm just not good at it. Like I've had. I've had. Like I'm either. I my qualifications are I can write and direct a movie or I can be a busboy. I have no intermediate <laughs> skills whatsoever. I don't even know how to work on movies. Like when I did. <laughs> Cabin Fever 2, that was the first time I'd ever seen a call sheet in my life, and it was my third feature. Like, I, I, it, it, I just, it's one or the other. So, yeah. like, you know, I mowed lawns, I washed dishes, I was a short order cook, I sold shoes, I was, I, when I made the roost, I was working at Diesel selling jeans, and I would go to, you know, Spain to the Citrus Film Festival, which is one of the biggest genre festivals in the world, and spend a weekend with Quentin Tarantino and all these people, and it would just be like so much fun, and then I'd have to get on a plane to go home. And I'd have to go to work, and it would be like yesterday I was doing that, and now it's like thirty-two, thirty-two. Let me go check in the back, you know. And that <laughs> that was very much what I was accustomed to. So when I could stop doing that, it was great. I mean, that was a fine job, but like, I'm just not, I'm not good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, once you don't have a job, uh, I guess unless you have some giant hit, which I've never really had, to where it's like I'm on easy street. There's definitely like this fear of like. Well, this the money that I'm making for doing this is only going to last so long, and it's not like you're going to clock in next week. So you really have to hustle to make sure that when that one paycheck runs out, there's another one there, or the credit cards come out again. I mean, I have a wallet full of credit cards. Um, so, you know, it, like I said, I'm not cut out for it, so it's better for me just to be able to just be a filmmaker. Um, but it can be, certainly when the money's running low, it's very terrifying, because the thought of going back is just so brutal to me. Like, if I had to go back to washing dishes, it would just be, like, so tragic. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of credit cards, have you put any of your own money into the films? Um, probably all of them. I've been fortunate that with The Roost, which we made for, once the theatrical was done, just a little under $100,000, um, and I, I probably only paid for 10000 of that. And Larry Fessenden was someone who always put up his own money to make that film. He put up all his own money to make Trigger Man. Um... And he fronted a little bit of the money for House of the Devil before the financiers came in. So he's always been really great and supportive about that and not fearful. 
Um, and I'm very fortunate to have met him and to have had that luxury. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, on every movie, there's always something like, it happened on House of the Devil, it'll happen on, on this new movie, The Innkeepers, is like, you know, you'll finish the movie, and then something will be bothering you about the sound mix or about the color correct, and it'll be, the movie will be done for like a month, and you'll be like, I can't handle how red that scene is, or I can't handle how loud that footstep is, and I'll just pay my own money to go back in there and fix it. So, and it's never a lot of money, but it's, you know, a couple thousand dollars that you'd rather not spend. But, you know, what are you going to do? I can't yes. live my whole life with a loud footstep. So, <laughs> <laughs> drive me crazy. No, I, 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 I would make a t shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's true. That's a good bumper yeah. sticker. You know, um, S. Lane Porter, that's Writer Lane nice on Twitter. She writes in On Writing by King is, one of, is the one writing book I never lend out. It's a great resource. Um, it's so, really phenomenal. It's a very yeah. easy read. It's, it's, it's really, really yeah. great. And then it, sh- it should be part of every writer's library. Um, how much should a filmmaker spend on their first feature film? Financially? Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, you know, or whether, you know, just all, what's a good budget range for a first time filmmaker, their first film feature? I don't know that it really matters. I mean, if you're putting up your own money, I would be very cautious because generally, like, especially nowadays, the, uh, I mean, you're, that's, that money is probably not going to come back to you. So, um, you know, I, I remember after The Roost, I was supposed to make House of the Devil, and then it fell apart, so we made Trigger Man, and we made Trigger Man for $15,000. And um, and that was, we could have even probably done it for a little less, but we made it for that cheap, because it was like, well, certainly there'll be some profit to be made on this level. And, you know, it was um, it was as stripped down as it possibly could be. So, but not every movie's like that. I mean, if, you're, if, if you have the mentality of you want to make giant movies in life, then I don't think you can go make a movie like Trigger Man, because it wouldn't be interesting to you, and you wouldn't be able to do it well. I think you need to figure out how how to communicate your giant vision um and is that a plane (laughs) 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 it does sound very loud doesn't it yeah that's probably the loudest we've ever heard in the studio we've done all these shows (laughs) hold for the plane Um, (laughs) movie jargon um so yeah i don't think it really matters i think you know the less you can spend probably the better off you are but Mm -hmm. like if you're the kind of person that only wants to make hundred million dollar movies you're not gonna be able to make a ten thousand dollar movie unless you're one of those kids that's like affects Genius, and you're just putting all your own effects in After Effects, and I've never been that person, so I don't know. Well, I mean, that's perfect, because that was actually our next question, because we hear from so many people that if you want to make money as a filmmaker, you've got to do a low-budget horror film. How do you respond to that? I mean, have any of your films lost money? Uh, no, I don't think so. I've, okay. been, I've been fortunate that, no, that hasn't happened to me. Okay. Um, and horror, in a way, is helpful, um, because there's always an audience, like you said before, with all those internet resources. I mean, there's mm-hmm. just a community that will that sure. will embrace it. Um, but you know, it, that doesn't mean that's not a sure bet. You know, and it's like a mediocre horror movie isn't going to do you any good. Yeah. So, and and finding something to do that's original in horror is very few and far between. So it's it's it seems like an easier step forward than it probably is. Um, but that having said, the the the, the the movie itself is the star, and you don't need famous people as much because you can be like, yeah, but people get killed in it, and that's its own element. So um, that helps in the low budget. It's always been good for low. It's kind of had it's like that. Kind of, it's like porn. It's always had like kind of its own hook. Sure. Yeah, any, any thoughts you want to add there? Tony? No, I was just going to say it's, it's important. You know, you know, I hear that a lot too. Is if you make your first film, make sure so, the horror film is guaranteed to make money. That's not necessarily true. And anyone shouldn't just go out and make a horror film. If it's not something that you're passionate about, you know, me, I'm a passionate horror f- film, you know, kind of guy. I love, you know, a horror film, and I know a lot about it. And uh, and I think if, you, if that's your passion, that's the kind of film you should make. If your passion is about, you know, documentary, make documentary. Mm-hmm. But just don't go out and make a horror film because you think you can make your money back sure. on it. It's, it's a tough world. Yeah. That's what producers do. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, we have this question come in from Lynette Carrington. She asks, uh, what are some of the very creative ways you have gone about raising money for your film projects? Um, well, I've been very fortunate that I've not been very creative. I met Larry <laughs> Fessenden, and he liked my short films, and he said, you know, how come you're not making a feature? I don't know, I guess I don't have any money. And he was like, well, if I gave you a little bit of money, would you be able to just go do it by yourself? And I just kind of lied to him and said yes. <laughs> and then uh, he actually just manned up and gave me the money, and we made the movie. And then after that, when the other movie fell apart, I kind of put it back on him, like, hey, let's do that again, but we'll do it for less. And he went, all right. And so it's I've never had to look very far for money just because I met Larry Fessenden, and I'm very fortunate because of that. And I owe a lot to Kelly Reichardt, who's who introduced me to him. And um, that made life easier. That, you know, I, he just said, I'll give you the money, but you got to do it yourself. Um, 
And then after that, because of those movies, I got a job. And then we went back and made House of the Devil. And because of House of the Devil, I got this next job. So, you know, I guess you're only as good as your last thing, I suppose. So I've just been fortunate. Okay. You know, and I've also been fired a few times also. So, like, you know, as far as, like, big studio stuff, like, that happens too. So it's, you know, uh, it can go either way. Mm-hmm. But, you know, speaking of sort of, you know, we talked a little bit about writing. We, we, we've now talked about budget. Um, you know, are, are you thinking about your film's budget um, in the writing process? Um, and, you know, or, or are you simply thinking like, you know, I'm just going to write the best, absolute best story that I can? Or are there budgets, you know, budgetary considerations as you're writing? Well, also, finding movies is kind of, or finding money for movies is sort of a con game in its own right. Mm-hmm. And so I do think about money because I think like, man, I could, I could talk this amount of money out of someone, so what could I make with that amount? Like The Innkeepers, for instance, we shot it at this location. It's, it's this hotel that we lived in while we were making House of the Devil. So I knew the place existed. I knew the place that run it. I knew that all the people that I've worked with know the place. We know the area because we just made a movie there. So it was like, well, this wouldn't be so hard to make a movie there, and it's an interesting place. So that, I knew, would be an inexpensive kind of setup for a movie. And I knew how much the people that paid for House of Devil were, you know, interested or willing to spend on a movie. So there was no sense in writing, like, a $30 million movie and having them be like, we don't do this. So it was, you know, I knew what I could get all of my own friends and crew members to get back out there and make a movie. I knew what it would take. And Mm -hmm. so that was a big part of writing this movie was, like, I wanted to get back out there and do that. And I wanted to do something very different than House of the Devil. So that part of it, yes. That having been said... um, you know, in House of the Devil, the house was supposed to burn down at the end. It was in the script, but we couldn't afford to do that. So, and, and not only could we not afford to do that, I didn't have the confidence that like the CGI that we could afford would be any better. So, you know, because the option was, well, if we can't burn the house down, well, we'll just do it as an effect. But then I was like, but I don't think we have, like, I don't have the confidence in the people that would do that effect because it's not like it's like Weta is going to do it. So it's like Ugh, it'll turn into a sci-fi channel movie. So we just opted to just not burn the house down which is fine. It's not as good necessarily, not as big, but that's part of the low budget world that you just kind of like, you just have to deal with that. And same with the innkeepers, there's a bunch of things that's like, well, you couldn't quite do it, but we'll do something, you know, it's not worse, it's just different. Mm -hmm. Do you make your films for yourself or do you make them for an audience? I make them for myself. I mean, I'm aware of, uh, I'm a pretty personal filmmaker in that like I write, direct, edit, and sort of in a way produce all my movies, which is, it's just because it's the only way I know how. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's less of a career and more of a lifestyle for me. So um, in that regard, it's, it's what I'm trying to accomplish for myself. That having been said, uh, I'm aware of, like, you know, scenes that are going to be effective for an audience. You know, I'm aware of, like, in House of Devil, what will be suspenseful and what will be scary and what will startle people and what will make people laugh. And, of course, if none of those things went that way, that would be depressing. Like, if I went in the theater and no one was scared and no one was laughing, it would just be like, oh, my God, what a swing and a miss. But I, I feel like I have a pretty... Um, like I have a decent taste, and I have a pretty. I'm I'm pretty hard on myself. So if I think it works, if it if it if it can work for me, it's going to work for some other people. Mm-hmm. Not everyone's going to like it, but like it it should work for what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. In one of the interviews we read about you, you mentioned discovering the people that you can work with, and the ones that you can't. Tell us what kind of people you cannot work with. We want the good stuff. I mean, as a director, you're dealing with everybody. Film is a collaborative process, so. Who can you not work with? Um, not to name names, but just sure. types of people. I well, I'm I'm <laughs> kind of a handful, you know. Like I'm pretty from doing all those jobs and having made movies myself and done every job on them, despite not understanding real movie jobs. Like I've done everything. I've squirted blood on people while holding a camera. I've, you know, made schedules myself. I've done everything myself, so I, I know how all the jobs work. So when people tell me they can't do things, that bums me out because it, it's like, no, we can do it, and I know how. And now I feel like I'm doing your job. And I get very frustrated at that because I come in, like, and I go all in making a movie. And I'm very serious about it. So I don't like people, especially in low budget world. A lot of people are there just to party, and that's a bummer, you know. Because it's like, yeah, the job sucks. Yeah, the hours suck, and yeah, you're in some crappy part of the country, and the only good thing apparently is the beer. But like, you know, this is two years in my life. I know it's just three weeks for you, you know. Hope, you know, but it's for me. It's it's two years of my life minimum and like your permanent record. So I get very serious about things. So I like people who are as serious and I like people who can really, who are better than me. Um, which is not to say that I'm great. It's just that like, like for instance, Jade Healy, the production designer I work with is like fantastic and is like better than me and elevates me and makes me work harder. And Graham Resnick, the sound designer and Jeff Grace, the composer, which is who I'm working with right now on the innkeepers. They're better than me. And it, you know, 
because of that, it, it, it kind of forces me to like come up to their level and challenge them to do better than they normally do. And that kind of relationship, I think, is exciting, and that makes interesting and, uh, you know, quotes, better um, product. Mm-hmm. Um, people who are just kind of like half-assing it or just middle of the road, that I have a hard time with um, mm-hmm. because I take things very seriously, and I just want people to do the same. So you like perfectionists, maybe? A bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean... Yeah, I, okay. I do. I, I mean, I like people who are, are really going to work really hard. I like people that are going to make me think I'm not working hard enough because mm-hmm. that's impressive and that that's exciting to me. Interesting. Okay. You know, we have this comment from Movie Angel. That's from Marcella. Hey, Marcella. Your guest today has a lot of humor. A pleasure to listen. He's actually very funny. Oh, okay. So. That okay. Part of the self-hatred is when I moved to New York, I wanted to do stand-up. That's what I wanted to do, but I don't have the guts to do it, or I don't have the confidence to do it, so I made movies instead. Hmm. But that is, stand-up is a very self-hating thing, I think, sure. where you find humor. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's kind of transcended into this. And, and we have another question from Lynette um, Carrington. Do you think some big-budget films could have been done on a small budget and been just as good? And do you have any examples? I don't... Uh, uh, they should give me the example. Um, <laughs> their idea. Uh, yes, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I, I don't. I don't have an example of where I feel like someone spent. Whoa, they spent too much money. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, I think there's movies that don't look like big budget movies, but have a lot of famous people in it, and you spend a lot of money just having them in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is maybe where it could have been less. But I don't. You know, you try to tell yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, and Lynette, what I just saw is there. There was an article published this week um, that has to do with um, sort of the new $40 million drama that a lot of films that were being made for $80 million, $100 million are now being cut back. And $40 million is a level that's working currently. Um, The Social Network is a $40 million drama, and I'm having trouble recollecting the other one that was just made that was successful at the 40 million so the, there, there's um some examples of, of them cutting back i would back. say also i don't know this for a fact but <clears throat> like i guess paranormal activity 2 just came out and is doing very well mm-hmm. i bet they made that for a lot more in the first one <laughs> i bet yeah, if they made it for the same i bet if they made it for the same amount they'd be making more money right now i'm sure they're doing hand over fist but at the same time like i bet this new one instead of costing I don't know what the first one costs, some thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. 15 grand. 15, yeah. 15 mm-hmm. that, uh, that seems fake. But that is, I mean, I bet, uh, I bet by, you know, it might have been 30 grand. I don't think yeah. it could be. Yeah. But, like, um, you know, I bet this one was a couple million dollars, and that really kind of defeats the business model. But, you know, it, not if it's making everything yeah. made $20 million on Friday, so yeah. you know, they know what they're doing. Yeah. But that's an example of a movie that's like the whole conceit of the movie is this is low budget, and then you make it for millions of dollars. It's like, well, that's just weird. Like, you know, you build a house instead of just finding a house. Mm-hmm. But I would do that. You know, if I was going to make a sequel to a low-budget movie, and I was like, well, pay my mortgage. You know, like, that's where I want the money to go. So I, I, I get it. So, Ty, your first film, The Roost, premiered at South by Southwest. Did you have a connection to get into the festival? How did that happen? I mean, that's, that's a tough festival. Game. No, that's just a credit to Matt Denler, who at mm-hmm. the time was running the festival. Um, I sent a copy... And he called me out of the blue. I didn't know who he was. And he said, hey, man, I'm calling from South By. And I was like, oh, cool. And uh, I figured if he's calling, this has got to be good news. And then he was like, yeah, your DVD doesn't work. And it was like, oh, my God. (laughs) Um, And so I panicked, and I sent him, like, you know, 45 more DVDs. And he called me, like, a a day or two later and was like, I guess the DVD worked for the first scene, and then it stopped working. So I sent him more copies. And he called me back a day or two later and was like, all right, so I watched the rest. And, uh, yep, let's do it. And that's really just kind of how it went down. And I was like, great. And then we went there. Um, So, I mean, that's an example of, like, when you fill out that submission form. I mean, now I'm on another end of things where, like, I have relationships with certain programmers where it doesn't get you to the front of the line. But it's like, I know, like, you know, Matt doesn't work there anymore. But after being in South By for several years, you know, it was very, Matt was always very aware of me. And I was always very aware of him. So when the time came around for the festival, we'd be talking about the movies and that is nice because there's a personal relationship. Doesn't mean it's going to get in. Sure. Um, but it's, it's that's a little easier. But when you know nobody and you just blindly submit, they watch it. I mean, he called me out of nowhere and had no idea who I was, and that was that. So, um, you know, and I submitted Trigger Man the same way, except for again, we knew each other by then. So you know, it's it's a little bit. Again, you you, f- you feel like you're going to get rejected just the same, mm-hmm. but you do know them. So when you do get in, you feel a little more confident about going there. Um, sure. And, and was that you submitting, or did you have someone submit for you, an agency, a manager, or that was just you I just did it. filling out the forms? I, fi- and I, fi- I filled out the form, put the check in the mail, and sent it off. <laughs> so that's the one benefit is after you made a few movies, sometimes they waive the check process. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. Save $40. Mm-hmm. Do you ever ask, did, I mean, in the beginning, did you ever ask them to waive the fees? I know some people swear by that. 
No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't think you'd be allowed to ask. I thought they'd mm-hmm. hate you if you asked that. I literally, I just, I went on the website, saw how to do it, I mailed it, and crossed my fingers. And thank God, Matt Dentler liked the movie because without that, I, I, there's no way I would be without Larry Fessenden and without Matt Dentler. Those are two major moments uh, for my first film. That if those two things hadn't happened, I'd probably still be working at Diesel. You know, we have a couple comments here. Um, Nathan Cole writes in, that's Waterhole Movie. Uh, Paranormal Activity 2 was made for $3 million, so there's there's the budget there. And Rad FX um, agrees, if you're working on a film, it's it's important to be a professional, think like a pro, do like a pro, a.k.a. perfectionist. Mm-hmm. So, he, you know, I guess he likes your commentary Very there. Cool. So, you know, it's, it's great to see some, some good feedback coming in. Um, we're, we're talking film festivals. Um, have, have you have you since since that premiere South by Southwest have you played at a lot of film festivals and, and do you think you ever stop playing the festival circuit with your films? Uh, I've played in tons, yeah. Um, I really like film festivals. Um, I think, yeah, if you do a big studio movie, then maybe there's really no value for it because you're going to get a you know you're going to get released in all those cities or states regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's you know it's nice. Like I said, like it's it's traumatic to making a movie and to go around and have other people who have kind of been through that trauma. Like kind of, you know, I, I've met a lot of really good friends. I mean, I think in two thousand five, South by Southwest had a very good year, um, <clears throat> and that's where I met a lot of people that I'm still very close to today. Like it was my first film was there. Joe Swanberg's first film was there. Mark and Jay Duplass's first film was there, um, and it, a whole series of people like that. And I just I got to know all those guys, and we became very good friends, and we became. Like friends and collaborators, and, and very kind of helpful to each other over the years, um, and that's you know when you live in Wilmington, Delaware, like there is no one else making movies. So when you go to South by and you meet some other kid who made a movie for ten thousand dollars, and you're both there with your first films, not knowing what you're doing, and you're getting kind of some respect and some credibility, like it's very satisfying, um, you know. And I've since kind of worked. Joe has helped me on all my movies, and I've helped him on all his, and it's it's that that stuff is invaluable. Um, you did something very interesting with the release. I'm going to go move here to House of the mm-hmm. Devil. Um, it was released on VOD first, and then it went into sort of a limited theatrical release. Can can you tell us more about this um, this release strategy and, and how it ended up working out for you guys? Yeah, I mean that release strategy is Magnolia's thing. That's mm-hmm. what they do. Um, you know, they release especially around Halloween. <clears throat> they really release a horror movie. I think on October 1st and then they released it theatrically right around Halloween and it sounds like it shouldn't work but it does you know it worked very well um, I think the movie to the best of my knowledge is the most successful on VOD as opposed to all the other <coughs> excuse me uh, platforms that it has um, and it's one of those things that I just trusted that Magnolia knew what they were doing because I had such a good time with them as a distributor that I was like oh they, this must be working and it did um, you know, I guess for me, maybe a week before instead of a month before sounds a little better. But I think the reality is that the cities that it's released in theatrically don't have as much competition. Like, if you live in New York or L.A. and the movie's in the Angelica or the New Art or the Sunset Five, you're more likely to go see, or the Arclight, you're more likely to go see, I guess it won't be Arclight because it's, if it's VOD, I don't think Arclight will show it. But um, you're more likely to go to the theater and see the movie and not VOD it. But if you live in Kansas, the movie's not coming there. You know, so mm. it's either like, spend 10 bucks and watch it and see it a little early to give yourself like that's a nice thing that they do for those people is like not only is it never going to come to you and that's a bummer instead of waiting for DVD we'll even give it to you before the theater and it's good for word of mouth it gets people talking about it so I mean I think it's great I think it's also just it's an inevitable future Um, I mean I think the inevitable future is probably what Netflix Instant has done Mm -hmm. um, because that to me is the most groundbreaking thing I've seen but this is just where it's headed is you know I was at Best Buy the other day buying something and 65 inch TVs are 1200 bucks now so it's just like people are going to have big TVs and sound systems it's just the way it goes mm-hmm. and all, all your films are on Netflix uh, yeah I mean I think House of Devil is on instant it's on I don't instant. know if the other ones are but they should all be there you know one thing I've been trying to figure out here you know I, I know when Netflix when, when they um, when you sort of go with them at least for their DVD distribution deal they sort of do an overall buyout where they're going to buy a certain amount of DVDs uh-huh. Do you know do you know how the deal is set up for the licensing in terms of the um net the, you know the the streaming you know what, what, I don't. The, what the difference is there I, in terms of I think of that's really the future I've had this conversation with a bunch of people I think Joe Swanberg and I had it recently was that like Netflix Instant has really been the biggest like whoa you don't pay to watch it you pay a month and you can watch whatever you want and you can watch it instantly and mm-hmm. I judged a contest for IFC and by judging that they gave me a PlayStation 3 which hooked up to Netflix 
right through my TV, and it looked so good because I didn't want to watch it on the computer. I have no interest in that. But when I could watch it on my like 50 inch TV, it was like a whole different animal. And I really woke up to how kind of um, progressive that that is. I don't even know how they do it so well. Um, but I don't also don't know how they could be making revenue because if you can watch the same movie 67 times and you're only paying 10 bucks a month, how does that work? Yeah. Um, they must have a way that it works, or they must be scheming a way that it's going to work in the future. I, I, I my gut just over the years of growing up thinks that the service will change and will be less good so it can make more money. Um, but as of right now, hopefully not, because Netflix has always been good about that. You know, And, and it, it's a, a big testament to them that when they started up, especially when I was in New York, when it first started up in the early 2000s, and all those like blockbusters, everyone kind of scoffed at them, like, this isn't going to work. And like, whew, man, like they just shut it down. So that's, it's it's pretty cool. So it's if, if they stick to being a cool company and, and trying to be progressive, I think... I think that's the future. Yeah, I just want to see them helping out us content creators and you know putting us. Position. They'll figure it out because they have to. Like if, if people stop getting DVDs in the mail, which I I mean I reduced my plan drastically to getting one DVD in the mail because so much is on info. In the beginning, there wasn't that many movies available, and mm-hmm. so now there's like they add fifteen or twenty a week, so it's it's gotten to be so many. Um, and so people will stop getting the ones in the mail eventually, and once they stop doing that. It wouldn't if they're not making money. They're gonna figure out a way to do it, you know. So it would be great if you could make a movie for ten thousand dollars, like Paranormal Activity, and you could sell it directly to Netflix and have a profit thing. But every time someone watches it on instant, you mm-hmm. get money, especially for documentary filmmakers, because I yeah. think a lot of people watch documentaries on Netflix. Like that's direct line to the audience, and you totally. cut out all of the middlemen and all of the studios and mm-hmm. all of the you know paying the ass people. Um, that would be really like a massive independent film movement. You know, it's gotten easier and it's gotten cheaper to make movies over the years. We're seeing sort of this this glut of, of films being produced every year. Um, so it, you know, that that part gets easier. Not now, it's getting that much more difficult to make people aware of your film to draw attention to it. How, how, how do you go about drawing attention to to your work? I don't know if it's if it's more difficult to draw attention because well, I guess in the way that like you're now one of a much larger number. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe that's something where like a horror movie gets more notified or a, a more controversial movie or a movie. I mean, maybe that helps highlight it. Um, but I don't know. That's just kind of a, you know, the whoever hustles the most or with the squeaky wheel, I guess, is the only really thing you can do about that. Um, I think the good thing is that movies have become so much cheaper and they've become so much more accessible for people to make. For me, though, like like growing up, making movies is not something everyone ever talked about when I wanted to do it it was like no 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 no, people don't do that someone else does that somewhere and um, especially in high school like I didn't have TV production classes or filmmaking classes where you learn how to do any of that stuff or edit I never knew about any of that stuff Um, I had a film history class where I kind of you watched all the sort of classic movies and kind of learned why they were great and that was very helpful to me but I didn't, didn't know about editing or any of that stuff like I learned all that on my own nowadays I bet kids in fifth grade, there's probably classes in school with iMovie and they're teaching you a final cut and they're teaching you how to make movies because now, yeah. just like when I grew up skateboarding, which is what I did, was like, that was frowned upon. Like, it was borderline criminal. And now, if you start skateboarding when you're like six, you might be a millionaire by the time you're 18 and people encourage you to do that. Um, and so, it, it's really changed a lot into things that were underground and things that were like kind of gritty or art are, are now commercial avenues. And so, because of that, so many more people do it and that means there's so much more bad stuff to sift through so you know it used to be making a movie was very difficult and now it's just making a good movie is difficult and you mentioned earlier that you met a lot of people I think at festivals around like 2004 Mm -hmm. 2005 and you've probably seen a lot of talented people come and go why would you say some of those people have stopped making films I guess money you know it's Mm -hmm. like I worked at the uh the mall and I met a lot of people who also worked at the mall and a lot of people still work at the mall Mm -hmm. and it's not because they had different opportunities or I had different opportunities it's just you know I I think it's important that like like it sucked when I sold jeans and made a movie but I just kept doing it you know and it was not pleasant but but I just keep doing it and keep making movies I mean I went like House or The Roost when it by the time we did the theatrical ourselves it was about $100,000 is what we put into that movie we shot it for 50 um when, when I when the House of the Devil fell apart and I pitched Trigger Man to Larry, I my whole thing was like, okay, you gave me ultimately a hundred thousand dollars to make the last movie, give me ten thousand dollars to make this movie. 
surely he'll say yes to that because we had a good experience and the roost made money so surely he's not going to go well this is a bad idea um but that's most people don't want to take a step backwards most people make their first film they make their little movie they made it for cheap and they got attention for it and now they expect to go do a big movie it didn't happen for me and it didn't happen for a lot of people and some people kept making movies and some people didn't I, I, one very inspirational movie, uh, moment for me was 2005 The Roost was there met all those people in 2006 I went back just to hang out and Joe Swanberg was there with another movie and I was like when did you make this other movie he's like right after I made the first one and it motivated me so much because I was like I was thinking I'm going to get to do some other stuff and he just went right back to making a movie and because of that he's here again getting doing this living this experience all over again and I went home that day and that's when I like wrote Trigger Man that's when I called there and said we got to make another movie because you know the competition the friendly competition but just seeing Joe nonchalantly be like what what do you mean when did I make it I made it right after the other one I was like oh you know it's like <laughs> right, right. he beat me you know and so that really motivated me to get out and keep doing it. and after that experience it was very eye opening that as soon as I finished Trigger Man, it was like, where's the next thing? Where's the next thing? And I, I just became very motivated to always be doing stuff and not rest on your laurels. And so it sounds like staying hungry and staying humble. Because I notice a lot of times people, they get a little bit of a big head. And, oh, well, that's not good enough. I don't want to do that. So it sounds like you were willing to do whatever it took. And yeah, I mean, I think you get humbled. You know what okay. I mean? It's like I, I, I can be as sort of arrogant as that. You have to have a right level of arrogance to be a filmmaker because you have to believe you know more than everybody and you have to have the confidence to think you can do something that's kind of crazy. So you have to have a certain amount of, of arrogance to you. But, um, you know, if, if you think that you're just going to rest and things are going to work, you will be humbled by the experience. And that's, that's what happened. I, Joe was there with a new movie and it, it humbled me to where I went, man, I dropped the ball. He, he kept going and now I'm behind. And um, that's just my own mental thing, and Joe's a good friend of mine, so that's why it connected with me so much. But, like, ever since then, I've always been, like, just I'll keep going because it's your fault if you don't. Interesting. Well, we're coming up on the end of the show here, but um, let's just wrap up with what does a filmmaker need to know for 2011 and beyond to advance their career? No, that's a broad I don't question. know. It seems to be different <laughs> for everybody. I think 2011... Like we talked about with Netflix, there's so many more opportunities. They're not as financially viable. Back in 2005, people actually bought movies for a decent amount of money, and you could, that's what happened. That doesn't really happen anymore. So, you know, I, I think just figure out the movie you want to make, and, you know, if you can make it for cheap, you're probably ahead of the game. All right. Okay. Well, time has gone by very quickly here. Thank you, gentlemen, for thank being you. in the studio. Yeah. Yeah, thanks we for having me. It. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ty. Thank Tony, you did you have a good time here in the studio? I sure did. I sure did. I hope everybody <laughs> comes out and see the movie tomorrow. Yes, awesome. cold That's stories. a good theater, too, the downtown area. Yeah. Yes. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. excited Very cool. All right. All right. Well, we've been speaking with writer, director, producer Ty West. For more on Ty, please visit houseofthedevilmovie.com and keep up with him on IMDb. You can also see Ty at the Filmmaker Forum this coming weekend at the DGA in Hollywood. And also, thank you, Tony. Thank for being you. Here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, all right. And thank you to all of you for joining us on yet another edition of Film Courage here on LATalkRadio.com. Also, thank you to Ronan Rosner, our tech engineer. He keeps us sounding great, and he's built FilmCourage.com, which we are so excited about. And we look forward to next week's Film Courage, where we will speak with Scottish filmmaker David Paul Baker. Until next Sunday, have a great week.